Hello everyone, Charles Watts here. Welcome back to Inside Arsenal. It is Wednesday. I hope wherever you're watching or listening to this around the world, you are having a very good week as we delve deeper into the international break. Not too long until the games actually start happening now, which at least does make the international break a little bit more bearable when there is actual football to watch. But despite that, there's still big news coming out of Arsenal today. Takahiro Tomiyasu, his new contract has now finally been announced and confirmed. He's been speaking, Mikel's been speaking, Edu's been speaking. So we'll take a look at what those guys have all had to say about the latest Arsenal player to sign a new long-term deal. Uh, we'll look at the findings of the uh, independent panel on Kai Havertz's dive against Brentford, which I think is going to uh, generate some debate, certainly. I've got plenty of questions and comments from you guys as well. So, uh, yeah, lots to get stuck into, even though we are in the midst of the international break. And we'll start with the big news today. As you can see there, if you're watching on YouTube, a very happy Takahiro Tomiyasu proudly signing his new long-term Arsenal contract. Well, I say long-term. Arsenal have announced it as long-term, but it is only till 2026. So it's only another two and a half years. Basically, there is an option to extend it by a further year. So basically it is till 2027, the end of the 26, 27 season. So it's not, you know, you're not one of your long ones till like, so 2029, something like that, but it still ties him down to, uh, to Arsenal for a good few years yet. And I think when you kind of weigh it up and I've seen people questioning the length of this contract and it is a little bit different. It's not probably not, you know, I, I have to admit I was expecting longer, probably one till 2028. Um, but I think when you look at Tommy Asu and his injury issues, that he has, that it's probably, you look at it and think it's probably actually quite a wise decision from Arsenal here. You basically got until 2027. You can see if these injury issues are going to persist. Uh, you're not absolutely tied and down to a really sort of long-term contract if the injury issues do become a real significant problem and you do, uh, you know, further down the line think, you know, well, we're probably going to have to move on from this one and you're stuck with a player for a long, long time. So I don't think it's overly... Um, surprising when you sort of delve a little bit deeper into it but uh yeah obviously love to get your thoughts on it you know how happy you are with Tommy being the latest in a long line of Arsenal players to sign a new deal were you surprised at the length of the deal let me know if you think it's a good thing or not in the comments below uh Tommy's been speaking about his new deal he says I'm so happy to extend my contract because Arsenal is the best club in the world it's a dream to play for this club so I'm happy when I'm on the pitch, I feel the love and energy from the supporters. We are connected a lot, so I want to give them something back. I'm playing for Arsenal, and this means I'm playing for the Arsenal supporters. That's why I dedicate my life to this club and the supporters. I want to give them something back. The connection between players and supporters is a different level, and that makes it more special. So a very happy Takahiro Tomiyasu. And look, I think this is a really good deal for Arsenal. I know the injury issues are a bit frustrating when it comes to Tommy and you know, he just gets into a really good run of form and then another muscle injury pops up and he's out for a, you know, six weeks or so. That can be frustrating, but look, he's still 25. I think the versatility he gives you, I think the quality he gives you across the back line, the options he gives you when he's when he's fit, I think outweigh the negatives of the, uh, the injury issues he's had since he's arrived at Arsenal. And, and ultimately, I just think this is a really smart piece of business. I think it's a, it's one that you you do without really thinking really um and uh it's just uh yeah i'm re i'm really happy about it and i'd be surprised if others aren't but obviously let me know if the injury issues are a bit of a concern to you and you think maybe this isn't something that arsenal should have done let me know in the comments below but um ultimately the players love tommy asu they're going to be delighted that he's staying mikel arteta loves tommy asu he's going to be delighted that he's staying in fact we'll talk about what mikel arteta has had to say in just a few seconds time um and Tommy Asu is really happy to stay at Arsenal. So it's no great surprise. You know, this was always going to happen. It was always just a matter of time. He needed to be rewarded with um, wages befitting someone of his stature in the squad because he was pretty low paid, Tommy Asu, initially. He's still not on ma monster wages now. I think he's doubled his salaries up to around sort of £100,000 a week. That's give or take uh, now, which, you know, modern football isn't a huge amount. Um, but... Yeah, he needed he needed a raise, and he's uh, and he's got one right now. Right, let's move on to see what Mikel and Edu have been saying about it. Edu says we are very excited to have Tommy with us for more years to come. He has huge qualities both on and off the pitch, and offers so much strength and versatility to our squad. Tommy is a top professional, and it's great that he'll continue to play an important role in the coming years 
as we work towards achieving our goals. Arteta says, we are so pleased to have Tommy commit his future with us together with his natural ability and strength. Tommy's attitude, mentality and values are first class. Tommy is loved by everyone and has been an integral part of the squad since joining us. The way he trains with his desire and determination to be the best version of himself every day is admirable. We look forward to continuing working with Tommy in the future years. So, yeah, as I said, you know, the way he is perceived around the training ground, the way he's liked by the coaching staff, by Arteta, by the players, this made it just a really easy deal for Arsenal to do. They wanted him to stay and they've got him to stay. And both of them, they're talking about versatility. I do think that is really, really important. You know, when he is fit, and I know he's not fit all the time, but when he is fit, you've got a player there who can play top quality football as a right back, as a left back, or as a centre back. Um, you know, arguably centre back is his best position. It's where he feels the most comfortable. It's where he plays for Japan. He plays very, very well, but we rarely ever see him play that role for Arsenal. Um, but he can play there. And uh, so, yeah, I think it's a really smart piece of business. And just another player to sign long term. We've talked about that, you know, for so many years. We've seen Arsenal build these good squads and then fail to be able to keep hold of their best players. Other clubs come in, cherry pick them away, and then you're back to square one. That is not happening with this team. Everyone now pretty much has been signed to new long-term deals. And you kind of look forward to who are the next players who are going to now be in the sort of sites of Edu and the contracts team to get them to commit. Um, it's quite interesting because it's been a, it's been pretty easy to spot who they were going to be because deals were running down. You know, last year we knew it was going to be Saka, Saliba, Martinelli, and then it was always going to be sort of White, Tommy Asu, players like that. That, but now you're looking at it and you're thinking, who's it going to be? Are you going to be Gabriel Jesus and Zinchenko, those type of players who you know only signed a couple of years ago? Will they be the next on the list? So it's going to be interesting to see what Arsenal do when it comes to uh, contracts from this point. But the work that they've done to be able to secure all of their top players and the players they really want to build this squad around, to get them all to sign new deal with very relatively few problems, says an awful lot about where the club is right now and how the players view where the club is. Right, moving on, we'll talk about Kai Havertz then, shall we? I don't know if you've seen this or not, um, but the uh, row, if you want to call it that, um, I, after his uh, dive, again, if you want to call it that, against Brentford, has continued. Um, the Independent Key Match Incidents Panel, KMI, as it's known, um, which is a group of sort of people within football who get together and they assess referees' decisions or big decisions in games after the events have taken place. And they're independent, as the title suggests. And they look at some of the key decisions. And they've all looked at the incident against Brentford when Havertz went down in the box under, I think it was a challenge from Collins, wasn't it? He was already on a yellow card. Didn't get booked at the time, wasn't given as a penalty. Brentford were fuming, Thomas Frank was fuming. He called it a dive afterwards. The players all wanted Havertz to get a second yellow card. He didn't. He went on to score the winning goal later on in the game, of course, as Arsenal won 1 0. Now, that inter uh, key match incident panel have sort of looked at it, it's made up of five different people, and they all sort of cast their vote on whether the decision was correct or not correct. And that gets sort of relayed back to PGMOL afterwards. And all five people on that panel. Felt that, Arteta, uh, felt that Havertz should have been sent off. All felt that it should have been a yellow card and the referee got it wrong. So it was a unanimous conclusion from, from the panel. Uh, the sort of findings that they reported back were Havertz is already falling when the defender makes contact, brushing Havertz's hip. The panel unanimously agreed that the on-field decision was incorrect and Havertz should have been awarded a second caution for a clear act of simulation. Interesting. I thought, I did say at the time, I have to admit, I thought he was very lucky not to get sent off. I did think it was a dive. I think when I saw the replays, you know, this, there was a bit of contact, but it was contact that was basically initiated by Havertz and it was contact as he was beginning to fall already. I do think he was trying to con uh, and blag himself a penalty. Out of that one, I think the look on his face afterwards as well told its own story. And I do think he got away with one. I think Arsenal got away with one. But look, how many times have we seen it on the shoe on the other foot so far this season? It's give or take. The amount of times Arsenal have been screwed out of goals or penalties or um, things like that because of what another team has done and it's not been picked up by the officials. You know, you just have to go back to the Brentford game last season when Brentford got themselves a 1-1 draw um, with a, a goal that should never have stood because the VAR forgot to draw the lines. It was offside and they weren't complaining too much after that. So, uh, yeah, it is what it is. Maybe Arsenal got away with one. These Guys on this panel clearly think Arsenal got away with one, but ultimately it counts for nothing because Arsenal got the three points, points, Brentford got none, Havertz stayed on and he scored the winner. But yeah, I thought it was an interesting point nonetheless. 
Elsewhere, as we head towards the international start in massive game at Wembley, of course, this weekend, Brazil versus England at Wembley. No Arsenal players involved for Brazil. Martinelli not there. Gabriel um, Jesus not there. And Gabriel uh, Magali is not there as well. Um, but Brazil are at Arsenal. They are training right now. Those pictures, if you're looking on the screen of Vinicius and um, Bruno and everyone like that, um, they were taken at London Colney. They're using Arsenal facilities to train ahead of that game against England. So I thought it was quite interesting because a lot of people in the comments were saying yesterday in response to what I was talking about with Gabriel, were like, oh, come on, it's not an injury. They've pulled the wall out over Brazil's eyes. It's just a classic international break injury. It's not the case, you know, with, with him. And there are, I'm sure there are plenty of those happening with players who are pulling out their international squads at the moment. But it's not with Gabriel. And the fact that Brazil are actually at London Colney, at Arsenal, you know, it's not really, it wouldn't be very easy for him to fake an injury there. Um, he did actually, I think he did his first, actually did the first session with Brazil earlier on in the week and then he picked then there was afterwards he decided to pull out the squad because of injury so this one is a genuine injury as I said yesterday it's not a ploy it is a genuine injury I don't think from what I heard that it was anything Arsenal were too overly concerned about but it is an injury and the fact that Brazil are there you know you can't you can't it's not like he can be training with Arsenal at the moment because Brazil be Brazil will be like hold on what are you doing training with them you should be over over here with us on the other pitch um, yeah, so I thought it was interesting. The Arsenal Academy boys all got the chance to go and watch Brazil train yesterday. You saw them all around the uh, all around the training pitch, watching watching them all go through their session. So it was a really good experience for them, no doubt. But big game at the weekend against England. Really looking forward to that. Bukayo Saka's met up with the England squad, of course. Declan Rice is there, Aaron Ramsdale's there, and uh, yeah, Saka looking very very happy as he should be with his big fat nice new Nando's deal announced yesterday and revealed yesterday. That certainly sparked a lot of uh, conversation on social media quite a few of you have already been in my comments saying you've tried the sauce already and you like it i haven't as i said i'm not sure i will i'm not exactly a massive nando's fan uh but uh yeah hopefully it's a decent sauce and it does him well and uh yeah cooking on and off the pitch as everyone was saying yesterday when they were talking about the kai saka but really looking forward to that game at the weekend as much as international breaks annoy me you know england versus brazil at wembley if you can't can't get excited by that then uh it's tough to get excited by anything when it comes to international fixtures Right, well, moving on to some of your questions and comments now onto that, this section of the show. Just wanted to start, by the way, thank you so much for so many people getting in touch in the comments yesterday saying happy birthday to my son, which it was, he was eight yesterday. I was talking about that um, on yesterday's show and loads of you replying saying happy birthday. Hope you had a great day. He did have a great day. It was fantastic. He was absolutely knackered. We're all knackered, uh, but he did have a really good birthday. So uh, thanks for your comments. And a couple of you here getting in touch. I just wanted to... Um, flag these on before I move on. Uh, Jeff here says, along with your son who's celebrating his eighth birthday, congratulations, Charles Jr. It is my birthday as well. Alas, 69, but a gooner all my life. First saw Arsenal when I was nearly nine and John Radford had just broken into the first team. The main reason for watching Arsenal versus Fulham was my father wanted to show me the finest passer of the ball, Johnny Haynes. I remember us winning 2-0. The rest is history. A gunner till I die. I hope you had a fantastic birthday, Jeff. Thank you very much for uh, for getting in touch. John Radford, what a legend that man was. Unfortunately, of course, a bit too, bit before my time, but all my videos I used to watch of Arsenal history and 71 team and everything like that, just a fantastic striker. John Radford with the ball, with the ball at his feet, with his heading ability, you know, him and Ray Kennedy, uh, Charlie George playing. Oh, what a brilliant attack that was for Arsenal, historic attack. So, yeah, hope you had a great day, Jeff. Thank you very much for getting in touch. Happy birthday to you. Mr. Nike as well said it was uh, his birthday as well yesterday. He said he tried the Saka sauce and it's sweet and sour flavour, not really his thing, but can see people liking it. Look, I hope you had a great birthday yesterday as well, Mr. Nike. Uh, 767, if that is indeed your real name. Right, a couple here from Teta98 that I wanted to talk about. First of all, at the top, he says, Hi, Charles, do you think we're in for any surprise sales this summer? Possibly Trossard, Zinchenko, Vieira, ESR, Reese, um, also Vieira, and then he stops. ESR, Reese, and Eddie, and the likes are a bit more obvious. If we sign the players we're rumored to be in for, that's a lot of first team level players will be competing for 11 positions. I'm all for depth, but Klopp and Pep tend to only have 18 quality players and we'll have a lot more. So I'm worried about some players who we wouldn't want to leave. Trossard, he says, might actually leave for first team football. I don't think Trossard would be a player Arsenal would consider going. There might be a surprise deal. It, ultimately, it depends what bids Arsenal get for players. You know, there's, there's a group of untouchables, you would say, at Arsenal. And we all know who those are, you know, who... 
they're just not going to sell unless someone came in with 500 million or something ridiculous. So yeah, and you can, you know, you can put your Sackers, your Odegaards, your Martinelli's, your Saliba's, Gabriel's, those sort of players in that mix. Or maybe not Gabriel, actually, <laughs> given what happened last summer. Um, but there's certainly a group of untouchables there. But then everyone else, you know, if a good bid arrives, it's probably something Arsenal will think about. And when you talk about surprise summer sales, you know, I don't think Trossard would go. But again, if someone came in and suddenly said, all right, we'll give you 50 million for Trossard, then they might well consider it. So um, it would be a, it's not something I, I would imagine happening, but um, it just ultimately depends on what offers come in. Zinchenko is an interesting one. You know, Zinchenko Arteta loves, and he always, you know, so I, was, I was surprised he didn't play in the Champions League game because when he's available, when he's fit, Arteta tends to go for him. He really likes Zinchenko, obviously. He finds him really appealing, what he brings to the team. But it's quite interesting what's happened since he's been out in this latest injury. The fact Arsenal have shifted away from the inverted left fullback and suddenly shifted it around. You've got the defensive stability on that side of Kivior, and now you're suddenly seeing. Ben White as the inverted fullback. Is that something that suddenly we're going to see long term now, even though Zinchenko's back, you know, because Ben White's been doing so good in that role. Now Zinchenko's back, do you flip it back suddenly and have Ben White playing more as the normal fullback and then Zinchenko going back to the inverted role? Or is it is Arteta looking at this and thinking this is probably the way to go? This is more the long term plan now at Arsenal. And would that mean that Zinchenko could potentially be a bit surplus to requirements? I don't think so. I'd be surprised. But again, if someone comes in, we've heard reported interest from Bayern Munich and Zinchenko, something like that. If they come and slap a big money bid on the table for us, well, maybe they would consider it. So um, I don't think we're in for any surprise sales, but I would certainly not rule it out entirely because ultimately it just depends what other clubs do. And if someone comes in with an offer that Arsenal suddenly find appealing, then it might well change things. Um, you also go with your dream wish list. This was in response to what I was talking about yesterday. And your dream wish list for the summer is striker is Isak, winger is Sane or Liao, midfielder is Frankie de Jong, Kimmich or Nana, goalkeeper Chesney or Kalen Navas. But then your realistic summer wish list, striker, uh, Jokeres. Um, winger Nico Williams Neto makes more sense and maybe can soon he'll be rotated with Saka Martinelli Trossard Jesus he can still be a better option as his minutes will be managed a lot better that's in talking about Neto's injuries midfield Zuba Mendy uh, my worry is Zuba Mendy will be signed to replace Party, which doesn't really make much sense and goalkeeper random goalkeeper nobody's heard of which could well be the option so yeah interesting one I thought there the um yeah the striker with uh, the dream wish list that would certainly that would certainly be appealing, wouldn't it? You'd certainly come away from the summer if that dream wish list came in, uh, came came up, and everyone, you know, one of pretty much all of those players came in. You'd be uh, you'd be feeling very good about Arsenal's chances next season, no doubt. Joe Wink says, "Hi, Charles. Question: It is clearly documented that Arteta and Edu have a plan in terms of who they want to sign in the summer. Last year, we managed to get most of the business done pretty early in the summer transfer window. Do you think this will be the same again this year, or will the Euros play a big role in it?" Could they be swayed in their decisions by some new, not on the list talents that stand out in a tournament to change their minds in terms of who they want to sign? I don't think so in terms of that bottom bit. I always think it's a, I think, I don't think it shines a good spotlight on a club when suddenly they go out and just buy a player when he's good in the tournament. I mean, look at Man United, they signed Amrabat after his good, uh, his brilliant tournament um, last time out at the World Cup. And he was great at the World Cup, but has he done anything at Man United? No. And you see it time and time again. And I always think it just, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't shine a good light on the recruitment department. If suddenly you're ripping up your plans just because you see a player do very well at a tournament, you know, you should have been able to scout this player beforehand anyway. Um, I think it is going to be difficult to get business done earlier this summer. You know, Arsenal have liked to do that. They've done it the last couple of summers or done it, you know, tried to do it the last couple of summers. But big tournaments always do impact on that. You go back to the last Euros, you know, Arsenal are trying to Ben White, sign Ben White, from Brighton before the Euro started. They couldn't get it done. Brighton weren't playing ball. Ultimately, the tournament then started and Arsenal had to wait until after the tournament was done before they could complete the signing of Ben White. Um, and I'm sure that's going to happen again this summer. So it's not going to be easy. Ideally, they will look to get it done um, if they can. But I just think it's it's a given that the big tournaments this summer are going to impact the transfer window and going to push some deals back until later on in the summer than uh, that a lot of clubs have ideally liked. Thanks very much for your question there. Joe, here's one from Discover It. 
2501. It says, something tells me for the first time you will read out my comments today. Well, there you go. I am reading out your comments today. You say this in response to something we were talking about yesterday. I think Kimmich is an Arsenal type sign in, but the second and less common type sign in. People like Jorginho, Trossard, Cedric are in this category. He will really add the ability to invert from right back with a quality probably better than what we get from Zinni. Arteta would love that. Yeah, maybe so. I mean, like, you, you, like you rightly point out, you know, we know the age group Arsenal like to sign when it comes to players, but there are some where they do just go for those more experienced players who can come in and hit the ground and be ready straight away. And you rightly point out Jorginho Trossard are uh, players who are in that sort of mould. Although you, both of those players were signed after the number one targets, remember, in those windows, Caicedo and Mudrik ultimately went elsewhere. So they had to sort of pivot and get something else done in that window. Um, but look, Kimmich is such a good player that I'm sure Arteta would be quite up for signing him if the possibility was there. Uh, I don't know if that is the case. Obviously, he's being linked at the moment. I think one thing that Kimmich does have as well as just outright quality is versatility. He can play in midfield, he can play at right back, can play inverted, as you said. And we pretty much know that any player that signs for Arsenal now has to be versatile and has to be able to play in more than one position because Arteta loves that when it comes to his players. So we'll wait and see. But you were right, Discovery. I did read out your comment today for the first time. Thank you very much for getting in touch. And finally, here's one from, uh, oh, how do you say that? Fede Aiken, Spice Lover, 69420, says, Charles, I'm usually the wet blanket that complains when we overhype young players, but I think any transfer plans we make this summer must include Ethan Wanieri. While I don't think Ethan is ready to make an impact for us yet, he'll be 18 this time next year. And we should be planning for his full integration into the squad. He can play in the positions we are looking to recruit in. Wing, second striker, left eight. And like Saka, he isn't the kind of player you look to get out on loan. He seems to have the support of Mikel, the first team dressing room. So considering we are changing our academy recruitment strategy, Ethan is our opportunity to demonstrate a clear pathway to the first team, especially if we plan on selling one or all of Carl, Eddie, Reese, and Emil. This is a really, really good point um, that... Yeah, you bring up here that I hadn't really thought about. And I think it's a really good point. You know, Ethan is still really, really young. Um, but I agree. I don't think he's a player who's going to, Arsenal are going to look to put out on loan. I'm not saying he definitely won't, but I, he feels like one of the players who are just going to be earmarked straight for integration into the first team squad. We're already seeing it, to be fair, this season, despite the fact he's still only 16. Um, but, you know, that he is going to, a, a pathway is going to need to be mapped out for him to try and get there. I'm not saying he's going to do it. It's impossible to predict right now whether he will become a first-team player at Arsenal or not. But you do feel like if Arsenal truly believe he will, and from all accounts they do, and they're hoping it is going to be the case, then there is going to be some sort of pathway needed to be there to be able to get him in and give him enough minutes to really start progressing and developing as he does sort of approach the 18-year-old mark, which, which we see nowadays. It's a sort of age where a lot of players, if you are for the top, top level, you do start to break into the team. Look at Mainu, for example, at Manchester United at the moment. Look at Bukaya when he broke into the Arsenal team and became a first-team regular. So I think it's a really good point and it'll be interesting to see if Arsenal do take him into account when they are looking to bring in their new additions over the next few months or so. All right, that's it from me, everyone. Thank you very much for your time, as always. I really do appreciate it. I'll be back tomorrow to do it all over again. Anything you want me to discuss in tomorrow's show, just let me know, as usual, by leaving a comment below with your opinion, your question, your comment, anything like that. And I'll try and pull some of them together and get them included in tomorrow's show. Until then, have a fantastic Wednesday, everyone. Speak to you soon. Bye-bye.